Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the UC San Diego Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. We are online on Zoom and welcome you all to lecture number two in Professor Dimdale's lecture series on 20th century history of coercive persuasion. Uh, two weeks ago, Joe gave a lecture on Patty Hearst and the Simulese army. Uh, she was convicted by a jury and sentenced to seven years in prison. Uh, not all of you were able to stay with us for their full uh, question and answer period after which we voted as members to either convict or acquit Patty Hearst. And you would be interested to know that we overturned the jury's verdict and she was acquitted by a factor of two to one by our members. Today we're gonna to talk, Joel's gonna talk about drugs of interrogation uh, and efforts by the government to develop uh, drugs for use uh, and getting information out of uh, unresponsive and uncooperative uh, witnesses. Uh, his video on Patty Hearst is already uh, in our library if you missed the lecture. Joel is a emeritus distinguished professor of psychiatry at UC San Diego where he had a distinguished career, widely published author, uh, most notably for his book, Anatomy of Malice, uh, about the Nuremberg War Criminals, and he's just written a book about this subject on coercive persuasion, an active member of OSHER and many organizations where he provides his continued leadership and wisdom, and we welcome Joel back to OSHER today. Thank you, Joel. Thanks. Thanks very much, Steve, and good morning to everyone. Uh, again, it's good to see you, and I'm sorry we're not uh, all in the same, the same room. Um, as Steve mentioned, I've been working on a new book that is uh, trying to figure out how coercive persuasion developed in the 20th century. You know, coercive persuasion also could be called brainwashing, could be called dark persuasion. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago in terms of Patty Hearst and um, I think a year ago, uh, uh, I spoke at Osher about uh, the, the Heaven's Gate catastrophe up in Rancho Santa Fe. But today I'd like to switch gears and um, talk about uh, a different aspect that goes back to the 1930s with the preoccupation with developing a truth drug could we in some way pry out secrets from people? Um, and that was a sub subject of considerable interest to governments throughout the world. So these drugs for interrogation came to be known as truth serums. And Truth drugs or truth serum, um, it's just another variant on interrogation techniques that are commonly portrayed in movies and frequently include elements of torture. It's interesting, on the far right is the Star Wars um, interrogation drone. And you can see that in contemporary films, the interrogation drone mixes in two aspects. Um, it obviously is terrifying and, and implicitly relies on torture, but also it, in a kind of curious way refers to the use of drugs that would be injected to elicit that effect uh, from the uh, person being interrogated. Well, why not just use torture? Um, for, for one fact, torture um, is distrusted. Uh, it's unreliable because people will say about anything under torture, whether it's true or not. Uh, and furthermore, some people are surprisingly resistant to uh, torture. 
For all of these reasons, during Stalin's purge trials in the 1930s, there was a suspicion that defendants had been drugged to make some kind of outlandish confessions. But in reality, the use of drugs of interrogation goes back to the 1850s when doctors started noticing peculiar side effects of anesthetic agents. And all of this led governments to pursue desperate programs to develop drugs to enhance interrogation. Popular culture was enchanted with the idea that you could use drugs to compel truth telling. Uh, you can't read this, it's from a very old cartoon. Uh, sodium pentothal, a hypnotic drug that forces a patient to tell the truth. If Superman knew I was under its influence, then he'd have to believe what I say is true. And in more contemporary versions, humorous uh, 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 cartoons, I'm still evaluating the new truth serum, you micromanaging, pig-eyed, snot-nosed, burned out, impatient, obnoxious, penny-pinching, glory-hogging tyrant. Or perhaps more kindly cartoon, scientists test their latest truth serum on a fisherman. It got away and it was so big. So this is um, not just a phenomenon of the 30s and 40s, um, and uh, it, it, um, it is omnipresent. One of the things that I was intrigued in, uh, there's something called the Google Ngram. And um, the Ngram is a way of analyzing word usage in the... Um, entire published English literature in books. And what I've done here is an analysis um, to look at the frequency of use of the term truth serum. And I've published, done an analysis in every year. So this is the frequency with which you encounter references to truth serum. And you can see that Truth serum really began to be noted in the mid 1940s, and um, uh, it's still very much alive in the English uh, language. So, uh, matter of fact, if you did a Google search today and you looked up truth serum, you'd find all sorts of sites that would be selling drugs that would force your girlfriend or boyfriend to tell you if they've been unfaithful etc. But truth serum wasn't developed out of interests in detecting infidelity. It had a far more serious purpose. As the world descended into World War II, both the Allies and the Nazis searched for something to facilitate, to facilitate interrogating um, enemies to reveal military secrets. This wasn't just a phenomenon of the 1930s and 1940s. To this day, the topic rivets the attention of intelligence agencies. A couple decades ago, the CIA concluded any technique that promises an increment of success in extracting information from an uncompliant source is ipso facto of interest in intelligence operations. So this morning, I'd like to focus on the early developments of drugs of interrogation. I want to flag in advance that I'll be stopping at roughly 1955 
and I won't be discussing LSD. The LSD work and the post-1955 work is so extensive that it warrants a separate lecture and maybe I can come back and do that on another time. But in World War II, both the Nazis and the Allies uh, began searching for truth drugs and they got there via unlikely routes. They got there through obstetrics, through criminology and psychiatry. So much of medicine is serendipity. Not only are discoveries unpredictable, but newly discovered drugs tend to be used in unanticipated fashions. Drugs for interrogation were originally devised for utterly different medical conditions, but in time of war, they were tested um, uh, in new ways and society was ambivalent about their use. First off, do they work? And secondly, is this ethical or appropriate? So the early studies focused on scopolamine, amphetamines, and barbiturates, particularly amitol or amobarbital. There was also a little bit of work on mescaline. In 1853, Dr. John Snow used chloroform on Queen Victoria during the birth of her seventh child. An editorial in Lancet at that time criticized this as a dangerous, irresponsible practice and warned that royal examples are followed with extraordinary readiness by a certain class of society. The queen was indeed a trendsetter, and the use of anesthetics in labor and delivery increased sharply. Case reports of the risks of chloroform anesthesia started accumulating, but some other observations emerged, which piqued the military's interest. Because chloroform is difficult to administer safely, other drugs were sought for childbirth, doctors turned to a combination of drugs to alleviate pain and the memory of pain. That might sound odd, but similar combinations of drugs are routinely used today for colonoscopies and ambulatory surgical procedures. The anesthesia does not to be, need to be so deep if emotions and memories are also blocked. If the edge is taken off the pain with an opiate and the memory of the pain is interrupted, did the pain really happen if the patient has no recollection of it? By the beginning of the 20th century, German obstetricians in Freiburg systematized the use of scopolamine and morphine to decrease the birth, the pain of childbirth. The British Medical Journal uh, noted there's a vast difference between the so-called twilight sleep as devised at Freiburg and the ordinary haphazard treatment, which has been freely practiced by many of us. This Freiburg treatment worked so well that some mothers greeted their newborn with amazement because they didn't remember even being present at the time of the delivery. The German doctors called this uh, Dammerschlaf or twilight sleep, and their technique was rapidly adopted internationally, despite continuing safety concerns and uh, very prominent religious objections that it wasn't right to remove the pain of childbirth since God had imposed it in Genesis chapter 3. Well, what's this have to do with drugs of interrogation? In 1916, in a small town near Dallas, the Texan obstetrician Robert House made a curious observation while performing a home delivery on a mother who had received 
the Twilight Sleep Regimen. And I'll quote his case report. Once the baby was born, we desired to weigh the baby and inquired for the scales. The husband stated he couldn't find them. The wife, apparently sound asleep, spoke up and said, they're in the kitchen on a nail behind the picture. The fact that this woman suffered no pain and didn't remember when her child was delivered yet could answer correctly a question she had overheard appealed to me. I observed that in other deliveries under twilight sedation, without exception, the patient always replied to my questions with the truth. It proved to me that I could make anyone tell the truth on any question. Now that was a bit of an inferential leap. Dr. House was a true believer that scopolamine could force people to tell the truth and that it could help exonerate or convict prisoners. He thought that scopolamine would be a crucial tool for evaluating testimony. And he commented even back in 1916 that one third of the arrests are shown by statistics to be in error and not all convictions are warranted by the case. Five years later, the Dallas district attorney asked Dr. House to administer scopolamine to two prisoners. Under scopolamine, one prisoner admitted to certain crimes but denied others. He also named members of a gang who had robbed a bank, something he had previously refused to do. His testimony was reviewed as demonstrating scopolamine's success in eliciting the truth. A day after the scopolamine interview, the prisoner wrote the doctor, I remember your question, but at the same time I was unconscious of how I answered or all that I said. After I regained consciousness, I began to realize that at times during the experiment, I had a desire to answer any question that I could hear. And it seemed that when a question was asked, my mind would center upon the true facts of the answer and I would speak voluntarily without any strength of will to manufacture an answer. Now I mentioned that the DA asked House to examine two prisoners. Uh, uh, the other prisoner about to be tried for murder emphatically proclaimed his innocence when scopolamine was administered and he was in fact exonerated. Other cases followed and culture is always interesting and human behavior is always interesting. So the cases that were used for uh, scopolamine as a truth serum were quite diverse and revealed quite different answers. A group of ax murderers in Alabama confessed after receiving the drug and people took to calling it truth serum. In Oklahoma, two people were freed after decades in prison because of late breaking testimony which emerged under scopolamine. But there were problematic cases as well. A Hawaiian chauffeur confessed to kidnapping and murder during a scopolamine interview. Then he recanted during a second interview. In the meantime, the police apprehended a different uh, criminal. The press nonetheless trumpeted scopolamine as a veritable truth serum. But it wasn't just um, obstetrics that gave uh, rise to truth serum as a tool for interrogation. Psychiatry did as well. In the 1870s, the German physician Karl Kahlbaum described severely ill psychiatric patients who were mute, stuporous, and didn't interact with their surroundings. Sometimes they stared into space, their bodies frozen in unnatural postures, or they made rhythmic motions, pacing awkwardly. If they spoke at all, it was gibberish 
Kalbaum called the disorder catatonia. Treatment then was problematic. Patients wouldn't eat or drink, so they had to be tube fed. And in the early part of the 20th century, medications to treat this were limited to uh, bromides and opiates. Barbiturates as sedating compounds were first synthesized in the 1860s, but it took another 40 years before their medical application as sedatives became evident. And there are scores of barbiturate compounds available and they all differ slightly in terms of absorption rate and length of action. William Blackwin from the University of Wisconsin published a curious paper in 1930. He was testing anesthetic agents and Blackwin wondered if uh, one of them, amobarbital or amitol, might be helpful in treating catatonia. He gave the drug intravenously to 50 psychiatric patients and found that within minutes, the drug was effective in treating severe agitation. Not only that, he observed in a few cases, there was a lucid interval for one or two minutes just before the patient went to sleep. During this short interval, the patient was rational and had complete insight into his condition. As the initial sleep wore off, the patient appeared dazed, but the patients asked questions and answered others. They discussed football scores, the duration of the illness, family and relatives. They ate. Several patients recovered spontaneously. One might have thought that a sedative would make such sluggish patients worse, but paradoxically, the catatonic patients came alive after receiving an injection of sedating medication. It was as if catatonia implied that the patient was frozen in fear and that the sedation, the sedation from the barbiturate thawed the patient. The reversal of catatonia with an IV barbiturate is about as close to a miracle as one uh, can observe in psychiatric medicine. Amitol was found to be miraculous in treating other psychiatric conditions as well. Occasionally patients face such tribulations in their lives that they flee their familiar uh, surroundings and lose their memories entirely. This situation is poetically called a fugue or a flight. One early psychiatrist described the situation of these patients akin to the plight of small children who have run away from their parents and are unable to give information about themselves. He reported that common precipitants of fugues were disappointments in love or financial difficulties from which there was no escape. Today, fugue is commonly referred to as psychogenic amnesia or dissociative amnesia, but the disorder is far more severe than normal forgetting. People may not recall their name or occupation, where they live or who their family is. May, they may wander for years under a new identity. The amnesia is not attributable to a head injury or drugs, but comes on often suddenly in the face of major stress. And these fugues are a never ending source of fascination in newspapers and movies, particularly when the patient regains her identity. Newspapers commonly run headlines like amnesia victims, memory revived by truth serum, or man unable to remember is re reunited with fiance. Although commonly reported in the mass media, Fugues are rare. Of the thousands and thousands of patients I've seen, I've treated only two cases of fugue. Fugue patients are helped by hypnosis or more often anti-anxiety medication. 
um, on the assumption that their amnesia reflects profound emotional distress. After a few days, the patient's memories start to come into focus. However, the most dramatic intervention occurs with IV amitol. Within minutes, memories and feelings flood back. So you see me ask, what is Joel getting at? Why is he talking about German psychiatrists and catatonia? Um, all of these issues revolve around drugs that somehow made patients unable or unwilling to talk or remember, all of a sudden they were quite reachable. Psychiatrists had observed that patients seemed to open up once they received IV barbiturates. Writing from Iowa in 1932, psychiatrist Eric Lindemann described one patient's self-report. Patient said to him, it's funny, I'm just telling you things that I wasn't going to tell you. No matter what comes to my mind, it wants to be expressed. I don't think I ever talked this way before. The words kind of just came out of my mouth. I know what I'm saying, and yet I don't know. The little guardian just isn't there. I keep talking and talking. All my reason says to shut up, but I feel like talking and taking a chance. Catatonia and fugue are relatively rare compared to combat fatigue. Warfare has always left psychic scars from the days of antiquity to the present. In World War I, troops were decimated by the powerful armaments and the static trench warfare. Large number of troops became psychiatric battlefield casualties. Some deserted, some refused orders, some froze in place. Many developed neurological symptoms like blindness or paralysis, even though they had no apparent brain injuries. In World War II, a third of the men evacuated from El Guitar in Tunisia were psychiatric casualties, a third. The military learned that soldier crippled by battle fatigue was a casualty, just like a soldier shot by a bullet. Early psychiatric interventions focused on evacuation from the front in the hope that rest and relaxation would help troubled soldiers to recover. Others used a tougher approach, heavy exercise and quasi punishment drills to make the soldiers snap out of it and return to combat. There were few medications to treat shell shock. Old standbys didn't work. Although psychiatrists weren't searching for a truth drug, they were eager to help patients so disabled by mental illness that they couldn't talk. In England, psychiatrist Stephen Horsley described an intervention he called narcoanalysis that combined psychotherapy with intravenous barbiturates. He sometimes repeated a dose over a number of sessions, which he quaintly called seances. Parsley uh, reported that barbiturates enhanced recollections and that shyness and inhibition melt away and the patient volunteers information that is otherwise confidential. Horsley said that in an hour, the physician obtains a quantity of information which would not have been obtained for a month by ordinary methods. IV barbiturates reached their apogee in treating trauma in World War II. There's something about expressing these intense memories were um, cathartic, even if the memories were not true. Now that trailing clause, even if they weren't true, gets to be very important as intelligence and military began to use these drugs 
in an effort to uh, uh, pry out uh, information during interrogation. The veracity of the recovered memories was not so important when the goal was to help a soldier uh, recover. Um, but to recover truth under interrogation, one has to wrestle with the fact that uh, intoxication with these drugs doesn't guarantee precision. The techniques were used on thousands of soldiers and civilians caught up in the horrors of war. Some of the most vivid descriptions come from uh, Roy Grinker and John Spiegel, who described the Tunisian battlegrounds in 1943. I'd like to just read one case report because it gives a flavor for how these drugs are able to extract uh, memories and emotion. Again, the veracity of this is not guaranteed. The patient was a mute infantryman who couldn't even remember his name. After giving him the barbiturate, the doctors observed. The patient lay quietly on the bed. He was told he was back in the Korean Pass and that mortar shells were dropping about him. At the moment of the word shells, <clears throat> he shuddered. He then got out of bed crying, Steve, Steve, are you all right? He then lurched around the room looking for something. From time to time, he cowered as if hearing an approaching shell and then trembling with fear, crouched on the ground just then a mortar came over and landed in a foxhole near me. It knocked me down, but I got right up and I went over to the hole. Two men were in there. The first sergeant was on top. He was dead with his head blown off. The other man was underneath. He was still alive, but the side of his chest was open and I could see part of his lung. He was crying. God, I still hear him crying. I felt sick and my mind was funny. I couldn't think. I was shaking so I could hardly move. The shells were falling all around us. I can still hear the sound of the shells. I can't go back to the front. I can't take it again. At that point, the patient woke up, uncovered his eyes, and buried his head on the medical officer's shoulder. Then he suddenly smiled and said, I remember. I remember my name, and I remember where I live. God, what a miracle that I can talk. <coughs> These observations from obstetrics and psychiatry became intensely interesting to the military. Both sides in World War II were riveted by the possibilities of using drugs to facilitate interrogation. Drugs potentially promised a quicker way of extracting information than traditional interrogation. In addition, if the drugs did really compel truth, their use would lessen the effects of misinformation obtained under routine interrogation. In Dachau, SS Dr. Kurt Plittner wondered whether mescaline could be used to interrogate enemy soldiers or spies. Um, he worked in the medical labs at Dachau concentration camp, where he did a number of lethal experiments uh, on the effects of high altitude, on hypothermia, on malaria, and developing new formulation of cyanide pills. One of his side studies involved surreptitiously spiking um, uh, inmates' coffee with mescaline and observing their responses. Some became giddy, some angry, some drowsy. He then interrogated prisoners about their most intimate secrets and found that they talked carelessly and openly. Now, the intelligence report from Dachau is maddeningly uh, 
grief. Um, Putner uh, questioned the prisoners about their sexual fantasies and their rage against the guards. He reported that decent people remained decent during the examination, but it could be stated that mental restraints hardly occurred. Sentiments of hatred and revenge were exposed in every case. However, despite this, he wasn't satisfied with Mescaline's potential military use, <coughs> noting that it's impossible to impose one's own will on another person, even when the strongest doses of Mescaline have been given. While the Nazis were studying Mescaline, the United States OSS convened a special panel to study drugs for interrogating prisoners of war. The panel included uh, prominent academics and somewhat uh, surprisingly, uh, J.H. Anslinger, uh, an indefatigable critic of marijuana who'd famously called marijuana the assassin of uh, youth. Um, Anslinger's membership on the committee is all the more curious given the fact that the committee eventually tentatively endorsed marijuana as a uh, drug for interrogation. But he was just one of the peculiar members. Um, George White uh, was a late addition. Um, where is White here? George White was a late addition um, uh, to uh, the committee and he be, went on to become notorious for some of the CIA's bizarre studies of LSD in later years. Parenthetically, those of you who uh, uh, attended Michael Parrish's lecture on, uh, on Ezra Pound, you may recall that Michael mentioned that Pound was uh, essentially locked up at St. Elizabeth's Hospital for a long time under the care of Dr. Winfrey Overhauser. And in the 40s, Overhauser, uh, uh, was in charge of this commission. So <clears throat> what the commission struggled with was how could they study this? How do you study whether a drug is able to elicit the truth from an unwilling person? Uh, so I'd like to spend the bulk of the time about talking about the experiment, experiments that the committee did. Now, first, uh, they tested some volunteers. They gave three officers some mescaline uh, uh, while then they hospitalized them in Philadelphia. Turns out, drug didn't do much, didn't uh, cause uh, uh, men to talk much about any information. Then they decided to test marijuana uh, on men hospitalized in New York City. They experimented with different doses and delivery methods. <clears throat> After giving marijuana uh, by mouth in liquid drops, they observed it elicited physical discomfort, but the soldiers didn't disclose confidential information. Next, they tried spraying marijuana vapors into a room where their staff were working. They thought the aerosol spray offered some promise. And then they decided to move into cigarettes, which contained uh, some marijuana. This seemed quite promising to the committee. Uh, they wrote, it appeared possible to administer an amount of the material which would bring about a state of irresponsibility causing the subject to become loquacious and free in his impartation of information, some of which it was felt he would certainly not divulge under influence of the drug. Finally, the committee commissioned a field study of the drug, not a field study of volunteers, but in real life. <clears throat> 
they surreptitiously added marijuana to a cigarette offered to a New York gangster known as Little Augie. Little Augie had previously been uncommunicative regarding various New York crimes. Uh, indeed, the uh, uh, police reported that the subject prides himself on the fact that he's never been an informer and that he has been instrumental in killing people who were informants. After two cigarettes laced with marijuana, little Augie started talking. He divulged the fact that he had been bribing a prominent drug enforcement official for years, that an associate of his, Hawkeye, had been bribing a restaurant in, uh, inspector to permit gambling, and that two law enforcement officials were blackmailing somebody in the liquor business. All in all, little Augie named names and provided a long list of revelations. During this, despite this promising observation, the committee had plenty of caveats about marijuana's potential use as a truth drug. There were wide individual differences in susceptibility to drug, and thus dosage was critical. Uh, on the one hand, in response to a low dose, subjects uh, entered a state of pleasant relaxation where they started speaking freely and related personal anecdotes with abandon. As a result of these studies, the committee was drawn to the potential capabilities of marijuana if administered surreptitiously, but the suggestion of surreptitious administration would have disastrous and lethal consequences during subsequent CIA-sponsored studies of LSD, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Meanwhile, others in the military became infatuated with amphetamines as interrogation aids uh, on their own, or more improbably, in combination with a sedating drug. The rationale for the combination was that the amphetamine would produce a, a rush of talking that would give the prisoner no time to think or organize his deceptions. One uh, early study uh, recounted uh, a case study of a soldier who'd gone AWOL and upon his capture claimed amnesia for the whole period. When the amphetamine was administered and the soldier was interviewed about his missing past, he started off in a cocky fashion sure that he wouldn't be tripped up by the drug. However, as the drug took hold, he began to realize that he couldn't hesitate, that he was speaking without thinking or caution, and or worse, couldn't do anything about it. The doctors triumphantly provided a snippet from the interview showing that the patient, in fact, remembered everything. Question, where was your first job? Answer, at the grill. Question, how long did you work there? I don't know, maybe two months. Didn't you have a social security card? Sure I did. What does that have to do with anything? Where did you get the card? Where does anybody get it? At the post office. Didn't they question you at the post office? Sure they did. Didn't they ask you your age? Sure, but what did you tell them what your birthday was? May 6, 1924. Oh, Jesus. The patient then begins to wring his hands, weep, and babble inco incoherently that they'll throw the book at me now. The most famous use of truth drug interrogation occurred when Deputy Fuhrer Rudolf Hess was examined in 1945. Years earlier, he had stolen a Messerschmitt airplane and flew to Scotland to try to persuade the British to bow out of the war. His behavior was so peculiar that he was placed in a psychiatric hospital for the duration of the war. While there, he attempted suicide, claimed constant pain and itching, and manifested very peculiar behavior. He felt that the jailed, jailers were feeding him nerve poison and glandular secretion of camels. When dining, he would suddenly switch plates with his guards so that he would not receive the poison. 
He was convinced that the British were interfering with his sleep by driving loud trucks past the hospital. However, Hess's most prominent syndrome was his amnesia. Under interrogation, he claimed he couldn't remember anything. His memory deficit was quite, quite unusual, twinkling off and on inconsistently. Um, was he simply malingering or was he experiencing a dissociative fugue? Uh, in May of 1945, he consented to an Amatol interview to help his memory. Nothing useful was elicited from the interview. When Hess was transferred at, uh, uh, to Nuremberg to undergo trial, he continued claiming amnesia. And the Nuremberg chief Pro prosecutor, uh, Robert Jackson, tried to compel him to undergo another Amatol interview. Hess refused, um, and the matter was left at that. Uh, so arguably, the most uh, famous trial in the 20th century tried to use an interrogation drug to compel testimony. It's questionable what this would have revealed uh, given Hess's earlier experience with Amatol. But this is not just a, um, a quirk from um, uh, previous uh, 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 times long ago. There have been continued disputes about the ethics of um, drug-assisted interrogation and the veracity of the information revealed. In the United States, that issue was eventually resolved in 1963 uh, by a, a Supreme Court case of Townsend v. Sane. On New Year's Day in 1954, the Chicago police arrested Charles Townsend for robbery and murder. Townsend was a heroin addict who was high at the time of his initial interrogation. He denied committing the crime and was jailed for almost a day, whereupon he went into withdrawal. A jail doctor administered uh, barbiturates and scopolamine, which helped the withdrawal symptoms. Townsend was then interrogated again and confessed. Now, both the defendant and the Chicago police agree to this much of the case. Townsend, however, alleged that he was beaten by the police and that they promised to get a doctor to treat him for his withdrawal if he confessed. He also stated that after receiving the medicine, he was dizzy and sleepy and had blurred vision, but acknowledged that he did confess. He fell asleep, and the next thing he remembered was signing a document that he thought was a bail bond, but turned out to be a transcript of his confession. The police, of course, denied these allegations. In any event, the Chicago jury found him guilty and sentenced him to death. After many appeals, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of Townsend on the basis that the, the lower courts hadn't properly considered whether his confession was coerced or freely given. Justice Stewart concluded a confession induced by the administration of drugs is constitutionally inadmissible in a criminal trial. Whether or not it's constitutionally forbidden, the fact remains that conf confessions obtained under the influence of drugs are unreliable since the drugs can elicit confessions from the innocent. Some people appear to remember things that never happened, also known as false memories, whether they're stemming from their own unconscious or the suggestions of their interrogator. That recognition was made by Pope Pius XII in 1953. He specifically um, criticized truth drugs or narcoanalysis saying that they often produced erroneous results. He was apparently referring or alluding to forced confessions uh, under communist rule. 
then he linked his criticism to longstanding church policy against for, forced confessions. Uh, and this um, uh, is a curious matter when, when you consider the Inquisition as well. In any event, the church policy uh, originated 1,100 years um, previously. Um, as, as Pius wrote, the judicial investigation must exclude physical and mental torture and narcoanalysis, first because they infringe a natural right, even if the accused is really guilty, and secondly, because all too often they give erroneous results. It's not uncommon for them to succeed in extracting the confession, not because he's actually guilty, but uh, because his energy is exhausted and he's ready to make any statements that are demand demanded. About 1100 years ago, in the year 866, Pope Nicholas I maintained that confession must not be forced, but spontaneous. It must not be extorted, but voluntary. During the long interval since then, we wish that justice had never departed from this rule. While the Pope positioned himself on the side of the angels in terms of interrogation, some surprising, surprising personages defended the use of um, interrogation drugs. Um, when the Covenant on Human Rights was being drafted, uh, there was an interesting discussion about truth drugs. The delegates had already agreed that no one shall be subjected to torture or to cruel, unhuman, or degrading treatment. Then the Egyptian uh, delegate asked to include a ban on truth serums to obtain confession, referring to their use in communist countries and in France. Somewhat surprisingly, the commission's chair, Eleanor Roosevelt, praised the motives of the Egyptian delegate but politically argued subtly, uh, there was too little information yet on the whole subject and that it might be dangerous to specify prohibition of one particular drug. The prohibition against truth drugs never made it into the document. Despite uh, the Supreme Court's ruling about truth drugs to this day, Courts try to force defendants to undergo an Amatol interview. In 2012, James Holmes was awaiting trial for the mass murders in Aurora, Colorado, and the judge threatened to force an Amatol interview on him if he pled a psychiatric defense. Uh, ultimately, he pled guilty and the interview never took place. Empirically testing putative truth drugs is problematic. Laboratory studies are pretend models, but the models are still um, interesting, even if they are inconclusive. The experiments um, simulate interrogations, but they can't really ethically produce the conditions that a captured soldier, for instance, might face if examined under a truth drug concerning a topic that must not be disclosed. Uh, some of the ways that people have looked at this in the 20s, New Orleans reporters assiduously memorized wrong answers to a series of questions and then were interviewed under scopolamine. Um, the efforts at uh, providing duplicitous information failed and they uh, gave truthful answers instead. Such studies don't prove that the drug works in the real world. People certainly get tipsy on the drugs, but could they be compelled to talk? More problematically, once they started talking, would they tell the truth or just blather on? Uh, uh, you know, the old expression in, in vino veritas implies that uh, people disclose things when they're intoxicated, but people also reveal nonsense when drunk. There's also um, concern that the sedated patient might be uh, 
more suggestible to the interviewer, and, uh, revealing what he thinks the interrogator wants to know as opposed to the truth. So many academic uh, investigators have um, played around with curious experimental designs. They typically uh, 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 recruit normal uh, volunteers um, at Yale. Uh, pairs of investigators work together. One investigator asked each volunteer to talk about one event which was humiliating or guilt producing. Then he told the volunteer to invent a cover story to disguise the event and to resist telling the true story when questioned by a second interviewer. Now the second interviewer was never told what the event was, but was merely told a rough theme, something has to do with money issues. The second interviewer then gave the volunteer Amatol, and the question is, would the subjects disclose the real event or would they be able to hold on to their cover story? As an example, one graduate student felt guilty about how he was spending the money that his financially strapped parents saved for his education. The student was spending money on political causes, but he kept this from his parents. So his cover story was that he used his parents' money because his girlfriend needed an abortion and under Amatol, he maintained the cover story and didn't disclose how he really was using his parents' money. Now, this was a sample of around 10 people. Uh, about a third of them held on to their cover stories. Amatol couldn't extract the true secret. And these three were regarded to be the, the, the healthiest of the bunch uh, emotionally. The other six um, subjects, uh, Yaley's, had various um, emotional uh, issues and they had difficulties maintaining their cover stories. Amatol pierced through the cover story to elicit the true story in two subjects and partially exposed bits of the true story in the rest. The subjects, con the investigators concluded that the susceptibility to Amatol depends upon the individual's psychological health um, and that the essential powers forcing us to confess or resist are within us. Not to be outdone, um, Harvard investigators um, ingeniously extended the Yale study. They studied again healthy undergrads, but this time they studied uh, students repeatedly in response to IV barbiturates, alcohol, scopolamine, morphine, amphetamines, atropine, and mescaline. What a combination of drugs. Prior to receiving drugs, the subjects were told to write down something from their personal history, like their mother's maiden name, and resist disclosing it during the interview. A research assistant then gave them a plausible sounding military secret, which they were also told not to disclose, disclose something like the troops are arriving Tuesday afternoon. Finally, they used the Yale cover story procedure again. The subject was asked to recall a humiliating event, but to invent a cover story that resembled the event. Over the course of four to eight hours of multiple drug-assisted interrogation, the investigators tried to extract information from the subjects. None of them gave up the military secret. None disclosed the personal history item, the mother's maiden name. But two of the subjects partially betrayed their cover stories. In other words, within the context of an artificial experimental uh, situation, truth drugs couldn't convincingly crack the subjects, even though, in the words of the investigators, they became semi-comatose, mildly delirious, panicky, markedly loquacious, or underwent transient dissociative reactions. 
Another test of Amitol took place in an army military hospital uh, where patients were known to done uh, uh, offense, but denied it. Um, a psychiatrist was able to uh, persuade them to uh, confess uh, 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 to the infractions. I'm almost done, but I'd like to conclude uh, by um, referring to psychiatrist Louis Gottschalk. Uh, I knew Louis. Uh, Louis ultimately was the founding chair of psychiatry at UC Irvine and was a philanthropist for the university. Matter of fact, if you um, go to get your uh, care at UCI Medical Clinics, you will note that the building is the Gottschalk Medical Plaza. Gottschalk, in reviewing all the drugs of interrogation, um, emphasized that the drug's effectiveness is not just due to their pharmacological properties. Many people are placebo responders and have told that a drug will have a certain effect like ameliorating pain or compelling truth telling. 30% of the people um, will experience that effect even if the drug is inert. Similarly, the way the drug is administered is enormously important. Administering the drug in a non-threatening manner and at low doses helps the subject relax his guard. Um, uh, Gottschalk was adamant that there is no truth serum which can force every informant to report all the information he has. Instead, people can lie or distort while under drugs. He thought that suggestible interview, interview, individuals who are easily awed by authority or plagued by guilt or depression may be less successful in withholding information, but they still um, may unconsciously distort the information and confuse fantasies with facts. It would be very difficult under these circumstances for an interrogator to distinguish when the verbal content was turning from fact to fantasy, when the informant was simulating deep narcosis, but actually falsifying which of contrary stories told under narcosis was true and when a lack of crucial information coming from a subject under a drug meant that the informant had none to offer. These questions of drugs of interrogation didn't stop in the 1950s. If anything, they accelerated during the Cold War and intelligence agencies rushed to explore psychedelics like LSD. We'll get into that on another occasion.